Let's take out our Bibles. Hey. And by the way, I use a King James Bible. I don't know about you, but I use a King James Bible. Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah, I want to start here. Okay, the subject we're talking about, of course, is apologetics. And that doesn't mean we're apologizing for what we believe. But the word apologetics means to defend what you believe. So it's a defense. And it does, it just amazes me as I read over, especially the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, how many times God so humbles himself to defend his own position on things. Explains things, makes it clear, warns people. Boy, warning is such a, such a blessing from the Lord to warn people. In fact, more than once, I think about how many times was I convicted before I got saved. I don't know, but I know it was more, more than once, more than one time, thinking about things. So uh, the warning, loving warning, you can say it that way too. But Jeremiah chapter 26, uh, one of the verses I memorized here recently is that verse number two there. It says, Thus saith the, Jeremiah 26, verse two. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, stand. Oh, by the way, the reason I memorized verse two is because of the last four words in the verse. Yeah. Yeah. The last four words in this verse. Jeremiah 26, verse 2, where it says, Diminish not a word. You see, some people are saying, Well, the words aren't that important. No, the Lord says here, Not a word. Not a word. Well, let's, let me just read verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. And this is what are you going to speak? All the words that I command thee to speak unto them. And then again, diminish not a word. Now, this portion of the chapter 26 here really is an apologetic and an explanation and a warning from the Lord uh, to Israel in particular. And of course, today it's throughout the world. Now, really at that time, it's throughout the world too. But I want to read more now, beginning in verse number one, back up to read verse one, number one, Jeremiah 26. And we'll see some of the apologetics here. We'll see the warnings that God gives. We'll see the time that he gives them. He explains to them what will happen if they obey. He explains to them what will happen if they don't obey. And how much God is trying to reach them. He takes so much time talking to these people through his prophets, through his prophets. And I want you to see all these different things in just a small portion of the scripture here. So let's begin reading now in verse number 1. Again, Jeremiah 26, verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, another to Jeremiah, a word from the Lord to Jeremiah. And God speaks through his prophets. He speaks through his Christians. He speaks through his pastors and teachers. Okay, verse 2 again. Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. Don't leave anything out. Not even a word. Not even a word. Not even a small word. Not even a word. Verse 3. If so be, they will hearken. Now he says, now if they'll listen to you, Jeremiah, if they'll listen to my word through you, if so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, because God speaks to people when they it's needed, when they need it. When they're going the wrong way, they need it. Every man from his evil way that I may repent, <coughs> that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. God says, I'm going to bring a judgment. Now that's the subject we're talking about. Judgment, judgment. Uh, apologetics uh, for God's judgments in this world. So here he's warning them, he's telling them, he's sending this man, our uh, evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. Because evil is wrong. Is that pretty profound tonight? Evil is wrong. Don't do evil. Now verse 4. And thou shalt say unto them, here's what you say, thus saith the Lord. So when you begin, don't just say, if this is my thoughts, but... Don't leave out, thus saith the Lord. You know, when we witness to people, I conclude, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Diminish not a word. 
The minister, not, don't leave out a word. Here's what you're to say. Here's how you're to start saying it. Start saying by saying, Thus saith the Lord. That should get their attention. Uh, if you will not hearken to me to walk in my love, which I have said before you, walk in my love. Love in the Old Testament, imagine that. Yeah. There's something that needs to be defended right there. Love in the God's love in the Old Testament. Now verse 5. To hearken, hearken, listen, pay attention to the words of my servants and prophets. Listen to what my people are telling you. I'm not going to speak to you directly. I'm going to speak through my prophets. Listen to my prophets. Listen to what people are telling you my word. My servants and prophets whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh and make this city a curse to all nations of the earth. There's God's judgment. That's what people don't like, that God brings a judgment. Well, there's reasons for it. And there's opportunities. And there's warnings. Now verse 7. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah. The priests and the prophets and all the people. All their church people. Speaking these words in the house of the Lord. So this is in, in their temple, or their church. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him saying, Thou shalt surely die. That was God's word through God's man, God's will, God's warning, God's help. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against, against Jeremiah in, in the house of the Lord. Talk about a church split. Verse 10. When the prince of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people now. So the military, the army came up now. All the people say, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with, his, with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, now saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house. The Lord sent me to do this. And against this city, all the words that he had heard, again, all the words, diminish not a word like that. Now verse 13. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he had pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. But now, but know ye for certain that if you put me to death, Jeremiah was even fearful of his life. If you, if you kill me, you shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city. That's interesting. Not just the, the, uh, them individually and the people there, but the city too. You know, we, we live in a city and we live in a, a state and we live in a country and we're, we're part of it. And when our cities and our, our states and our governments prosper, then we share in that prosperity. It's a pleasant thing when everything's going well for your state, your cities, your nation, isn't it? But when it's just the opposite, that's a problem. And, and we share with that too. Bring innocent blood upon yourselves, upon the city, and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Uh, the, the princess said he's not worthy to die, but anyways, they dealt with Jeremiah. But the thought is, here's the defense. God is saying, these are all my words, and speak all my words. Don't diminish, not a word. Now, this applies, that's why we are kind of hard-headed in our church here about our Bible translation. Right. Because we believe every word should be translated. Right. And the English, but the King James Bible is the only one that really is every single word. A word... Uh, the words are translated. Well, that's a whole other stu subject, but but this kind of deals with the issue of apologetics. Apologetics. Now let's take out your notes. Uh, page number two. It's page number two tonight. By the way, if you want to send the notes from the previous weeks, that's on the back table too, a little bit over the left side of the table. But here's page two, apologetics. And we see a couple of verses here that have some blanks in it. So let's see if you can guess, or if you haven't done it already. But Psalm 89, verse 14, 
Well, let's, I tell you, let's look at such a good verse here. I don't want to just go over too quickly. Psalm 89 and verse number 14. There's a good, <clears throat> in fact, this is a good verse to memorize. Psalm 89, verse 14. Justice, that's the first blank, and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. The God who exists is a God who is also judge. And it says in John chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ, all judgment is given unto the Son. They all should honor the, the, uh, the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. So Jesus Christ, all judgment is given unto Jesus Christ. So whether it's the great white throne judgment for the lost people, or it's the people's seat judgment for the Christians, Jesus Christ is the judge. And he will do a perfect judgment in all things. So justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. It will be absolute, perfect justice. Absolute, perfect judgment. Not too little, not too much, exactly what's right. It's interesting to read the Gospels with that thought in mind, too. But when Jesus was here, he was already doing some judgments, wasn't he? He was judging different people's actions. He was judging some of the things they said. He was judging people, uh, according, some of them according to their degrees of guilt. When he told the Pharisees, yours is a greater damnation. Strong words. That term greater is a term of degrees. Jesus was saying, the Pharisees, unless they would have gotten to say themselves, uh, their, their, their judgment is going to be worse, hard, more harsh than other people. Yours is a greater damnation. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth <coughs> shall go before thee. So mercy and truth is involved in judging. Mercy and truth is involved with God here. Mercy shows mercy in the right way when, when people can be forgiven. Truth shall go before thy face. They said, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. There's a lot of blessings in the Bible, isn't there? I enjoy that. But justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Justice and judgment. No wrong judgments at all. Absolute perfection. When God does a, just, a judgment, it's absolute perfection, absolutely right. And again, like I said, let me read this again. When you're reading the Gospels through, notice the times when Jesus Christ is judging people. Notice that when he judges their actions and their attitudes and their motives and even their thoughts, Jesus Christ has a much better way to judge people because he even knows what people are thinking. Right? Thank you. I remember one time I was preaching, I said that, you know, it's not like a Sunday morning. You know, Jesus Christ is listening to what, Jesus Christ knows what you're thinking right now. He knows if your mind is wandering. He knows if you're taking it seriously. He knows if you are not taking it seriously or rejecting it. Jesus Christ even knows what people think. And he remembers every thought of every person who ever lived. You say, how can that be? Because he's God. Because he's got, he's got total recall of all these things. So there we see so what a good verse. Then we're not turning to Genesis 18 right now, but Genesis 18, 25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Question mark. So he will do right the judge and his judgments. He shall not the judge of all the earth. He's judging everything in the earth. The whole planet, this whole planet, shall not judge the judge of all the earth do right? And that's a rhetorical question. The answer to that is what? Yeah, yes, absolutely, in fact. All right, now let's continue on the notes here a little bit. A defense of God's judgment is right, is a right for God to judge and punish people. Let's get, bring up a lot of different thoughts here. First of all, number one, to note God's original purpose and intent for creation of mankind was good. Was good. Uh, he created well, the whole creation. He said it was good. He created Adam and Eve, mankind, and it was good. Now, he also gave mankind that free will, you know, where they can make their choice. But everything was intended for good. Nothing was intended for evil. God wanted everything to be good. So when people criticize the Lord about his judgments, all these things, 
You understand his original intent was for good things to be. Because he wanted a, a, a people, a, a creation of people that could uh, be with him. And he could, he could honor and he could glorify and he could uh, praise him. And they could sing his honor and glory and worship him. And, and he could bless them with abundantly all throughout eternity. That's what his original intent was of God. Not for evil. Now he knew evil would come in. Because the plan of salvation was set at the foundation of the world. He knew that, but he also made the great plan where he himself, God himself, would become a man to die in our place, or to die for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins. Why don't our people consider that? Yeah. Now, why don't, why don't people think about the God of this universe so humbled himself to become a man and allow himself to be treated like he was. But he had to do something no one else could do. I think a clever way of saying it is he had to do something that he could not do as God. And that is what? Die. So Jesus Christ, God himself became a man. Because he had to do something he could not do as God. God can't die. So he had to become a man because a man could die. So therefore, Jesus Christ had to be that sacrifice. And he had to do what he couldn't do as God. He had to become a man because he had to die for people's sins. All right, number two on the notes. To defend judgment is to exalt morality, goodness, and righteousness. Yeah, you see what's happening in America today, and in some of our big cities even, where they're not bringing a judgment in the cities right. for those that are law-breaking. Uh, law and even, well... Even up to the point of murdering people, and they're not—they're not, they're not uh, judging them, and therefore the, the cities are being destroyed. Yep. Now I believe that's uh, the Lord stepping back from His protection and says, "Here's what happens when when you don't believe on Me. Right. Here's what happens when you reject Me. Here's what happens when you turn from My ways and My word and My will. Here's what happens. Look at it. Here's evidence of what happens when people turn from God. This is what it turns into people act like animals." Animals. Yep. So to defend judgment is to exalt morality, goodness, and righteousness. A lack of judgment means that evil is not worth confronting or punishing. You say, you, don't, you want to have judgment? Oh, there is a verse. There's a verse in Proverbs. I was going to look it up, and I just thought of it now. I, well, I'll find it this week, hopefully. Okay, lack of judgment means that evil is not worth confronting or punishing. Is it not... Here's a, here's a saying I heard years ago, a little thought I heard years ago, and I think it's good. In, in people's estimation and thoughts sometimes, if they do something wrong and not punished, it's, it's uh, if what I do doesn't matter, then what I am doesn't matter. You understand what that means? If, my act, if what I do doesn't matter, like I can do wrong and nobody cares and nobody punishes me for doing wrong, if, if not, what I do doesn't matter, then who I am doesn't matter. Does that connect? You get that connection? Yeah. If what I do, because I am what I do, yeah. and if what I do doesn't matter, then I don't matter. And that's the way people are today. Uh, they, they, what they do doesn't matter to anybody, so they think, well, it doesn't matter then. I don't matter. If what I do doesn't matter, what I say doesn't matter, what I think doesn't matter, then I don't matter. Interesting thought there. The evil is not worth confronting or punishing. It is of little consequence, not serious enough for retribution. No, when people do wrong, they shouldn't be punished for that. Just say, that's wrong action. And we don't want that from you. We want better things from you. Even down in Florida, a couple of times when I paddled one of my students, and they, they, they handled that the right way and everything. But uh, I didn't like do it. I didn't want to do that. I think I did not want to paddle them more than they did not want to be paddled. I really do. Because I had a very hesitating thing, but they would say, you know, they get a certain, I'm in, and the man teacher could only paddle a, a, a male a student, and, and there had to be somebody else there as a witness, the manager, the, uh, they were the, one, uh, the one that was overseeing things. They had to be there to witness that, too. You know, they couldn't just paddle by yourself. But there were a couple of times I had to paddle, but I, I didn't want to have to do that. I just didn't like doing that at all. Why can't everybody be happy? Why can't kids behave? Why can't students in school behave? Why can't they listen to their teachers? Why are there always re rebels and people, people on the right off? Where does that come from? And then it, it's needed to be corrected. Otherwise, you're saying you're not important. You have no value. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. If what you do 
doesn't matter. You don't matter. Interesting connection there. All right, number three. Let's go on. Number three. Remember God's long patience with those individuals and nations who sinned for many years. God's judgments were not because he is short-tempered or impatient. They, his judgments did not come up quickly. They came up after his long patience was finally given out. Nineveh finally was judged, but it was 400 years later. Are, are you that patient with things? God was and is. He's patient, especially when he knows that people will repent and turn and start to do things the right way. So people cannot criticize God and his judgments by saying he, uh, he's short-tempered or impatient. No, not at all. Not at all. They can't use that excuse there. Number four, is it right to make a judgment on God and accuse him of wrongdoing? You talk about pride, arrogance, arrogance. Is it right to make a judgment on God and accuse him of wrongdoing? The God that, you know, he's the rock, his work is perfect, all his ways are judgment, without truth, without iniquity, just and right is he. He's absolutely right in everything. He never does anything wrong. And yet people can criticize that. People criticize God. So who's the, who's the real problem? Not God. God's always perfect. But God is patient in dealing with people too. He doesn't quickly, he doesn't quickly bring a judgment on them. Next up in line there it says, in actuality they're doing what they're criticizing God about judging. They say God should be judging. So they're judging God for judging. They're saying it's wrong for him to judge things. The next line says, they are themselves setting themselves up as a judge on right and wrong. They're saying, well, this, God is doing this wrong. God is doing this right. But God's doing that wrong. So they're setting themselves up as a judge. What they're criticizing God for, they're uh, doing themselves. They're guilty of themselves. Judging. Next line. Only in this case, they, in this case, they are setting themselves up as judges of God. Judges of God. Instead of reading the scriptures and find out what God, how God handles himself in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they should be thinking about how God is right in everything he does. So, so why is this right? Now, how does this turn out to be correct thing? And never ever criticize God. People can ask sincere questions, yes, because they want a right answer. They're, they're seeking, they're searching. So the attitude makes a big difference there. But a lot of people ask questions and try to make God look like the bad guy. The bad guy. Don't you realize you could be out doing something else here on Wednesday night? You could be out, could be out having fun. You know what I'm saying? You could be out there doing the things that the world does. Instead, you go to church, you go to Bible study on Wednesday night. What is wrong with you? You know, but you want to go have what what kind of God? Make sure you just go to church and sit there and listen to somebody teaching in the Bible. Well, how boring that is. How, uh, why, why would you want to go and see that? Why would you want to, what's the word, uh, subject yourself to that? You're going to a church, hearing the Bible study. Well, they have no idea, don't they? Nope. The joy that's in learning the Word of God. Hey. The excitement of it. How valuable, uh, the, the length of it, eternity, makes the eternal difference. Uh, we need to pray for them. We need to continue witnessing them. Get, drag them out to church. Get them out here. Maybe they'll hear something, too. All right, again, now number, five, now number five. In all of God's judgment, there is a perfect judge and perfect sentencing. Not too much or too little, because Jesus himself will be doing the judging. And so his judgment is perfect. Perfect. Uh, it's, he's going to be perfect, perfect as judge, perfect in his sentencing. And then he says... Yeah, well done, good and faithful servant. By the way, a judging when the Lord judges, especially for the Christians, it's a judgment to give out rewards. To see if we've earned rewards. Not if we deserve some kind of punishment. Because as Christians, we know our sins are forgiven. So when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll not give account of our sins. I was reading one of my theology books again. Uh, last night, in fact, it was... I was reading, I, was, I kind of opened it up, flipping through my theology, one of my theology books there. Kind of started reading at one place where it said that again. I thought, there it is right there in my theology book. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. Jesus Christ died for our sins. As clear and plain as can be in my, in my theology books. And it just felt good to see it again. 
in my theology books. All of God's judgments are perfect. He's the perfect judge, sentencing. We're not going to be judged for our sins. We're we'll judged for our service. So be faithful and serve the Lord. Number six in the outline. Disobedience deserves punishment. Imagine if there was no judgment for rebellion and sin. Well, again, case in point, some of the cities in America, some of the large cities, where they're not judging the people that are rebelling and, and destroying things and even hurting people, the things that are going on. And they're not going to be punished for that because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Right. Yep. Because there's no punishment that people say, hey, have no problem here. I'll just go out and do it some more. And worse. And worse. They need more. Uh, disobedience deserves punishment. Number seven, judgment reflects God's character being just and doing justice. Yeah, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 18 here. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel chapter 18. And verse 25 <clears throat> and 29 in particular. Just reflects God's character. If the Lord would let any sin slip by unjudged, it would destroy his own holiness. God can't do that. Absolutely holy. All right, Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse 25. says, yet they say, now this is where they're accusing God. Yet he say, he say, Israelites, the way of the Lord is not equal. The word equal, that means not fair. That God's not fair. The way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, and are not your, way, your ways unequal, unfair? Equal, unequal. To me, that God even took the time to I can almost use the word argue with them. The way of the Lord is not equal. The said, here's what you're saying. The Lord, way of the Lord is not equal, not fair. Here now, O house of Israel, it's not my way equal or not your way's unequal. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. God is saying, no, you're wrong. I I'm doing what's right. Now also, let's see, verse number, what's the other, verse 29 also here. Verse 29. Yet say the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. The house of Israel. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Now verse 30. Therefore, because of that, I will judge you, O house of Israel. Now why will he judge them? Because they're claiming that his, God's ways are not equal. Or will he judge them because their ways are unequal? Or is it both? Will he judge them because they're saying that God's ways are not equal? Are they say, they're saying that God is not fair? But also then, their ways are unequal or not fair. They're claiming that God is guilty of what they are guilty of. Amen? Is that what it says there? God says, no, I'm not guilty of what you're claiming me to be guilty of, but you are guilty of what you're claiming me to be guilty of. You know, a lot of times people will see in other people their own personal sins. They'll see in other people different things that they're uh, guilty of, and they'll see other, the same thing in other people. The same thing here in this verse. That's what's happening here. Then verse 29 again, he had saved the house of Israel, the way the Lord is not. Verse 30, therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord. Repent. Now he says, okay, we're, we have, have this argument here, have this debate. You're saying I am not fair, and I'm saying I am fair, and you're not fair. He says, repent. There's the answer. Repent. And turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Now, why? What's one of the main reasons that God tells us about things? The last one, my Bible, is the last line. See, one, two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven words. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. 
Iniquity will ruin you. Sin will ruin you. Sin will destroy you. Do you believe that tonight? I believe every Christian in the room tonight believes that. Now we're going to stop here for this, this evening. And I'll stop you. That'd be a good place to stop. That your iniquity should not be your room. God says repent because he doesn't want people to be ruined because of the consequences of their sin. And for all that have sinned, they have come short of the glory of God. There's no good consequences of sin at all. Sin deceives people. They think they're getting away with it. They think it's making them happy, but season just for a season, they can enjoy sin. Okay, apologetics, talking about some of the defenses, why we, why we, uh, we, de we defend the Lord here on his judgments. And even he defended himself here. He says, I am fair. I'm not unequal. I'm equal. I'm fair in everything I do. He can't be unfair at all. That's the God of the Bible. Good, important study in this age because people are becoming more and more critical, outwardly critical of the Lord, aren't they? They really are becoming more, not the word blasphemy, blasphemy deals with who is God, if Jesus is God or not, but, but the, the, the things in our lives, the things in our life that people are being more blatant about their criticism of God too. And it's a little scary to see. Sad thing too. Very sad thing, isn't it? But God's in control. He takes the time. He's patient with people. He tells them to repent. He, he takes the time to argue with them, a little back and forth, because he wants to get them to say. He wants to see, see them repent. And here's the key right there, repent. That word is real important. Repent. So they will repent and get right. And then they can be on God's side. God can bless them, use them, give them joy and eternal life if they will repent. repent. Father, thank you for this good study tonight. Kind of sobering, a very serious thing, very serious subject, Lord. But I pray you'll work in each one of our lives that might have motivated us to continue serving, to continue witnessing, and rejoicing in what we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Now, again, dismiss it with your blessing. Help us be faithful, a good, faithful Christian out there in the world. For it is in Jesus' name now we pray and ask it.